Hello everyone, welcome to the Homestead's YouTube channel. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, we're gonna discuss a new venture on the property, a, a new investment, and that is shiitake mushroom cultivation. So, shiitake mushrooms have been cultivated for around 2,000 years, give or take, uh, that's the estimate anyways. They originated in the Far East, most likely Japan, and Japan today still is responsible for around 83% of shiitakes available on the open market. More recently, China and North America have started cultivating this species, and um, it's something that you can do if you're in North America and you have access to hardwood logs. So why would you want to grow these on your property? Well, first of all, they taste really great. Um, people compare them to, or yeah, they use the anecdote, I guess, uh, the steak of, of mushrooms. So that alone is, is probably a pretty good reason for most of you out there watching this video. If you're already interested in looking this up, you probably already know that. But uh, yeah, so they taste really great. Um, they have an abundance of health benefits and vitamins and minerals. So I'm not going to get into all those, but uh, say there's around 17 to 20 essential vitamins and minerals located within the mushrooms and a lot of them have very high values. So 15% or more is considered really high for daily values. Um, I would say around 12 to 15 of them are in the 5 to 10% of your daily recommended intake range which is quite high for a, a, a one thing that you're eating in a day. And then there's four or five different vitamins and minerals that are clocking around 20 to 25, even 35% in one instance. And uh, that's extremely, extremely high off the charts. So yeah, the, the, the health benefits, um, it's, it's, they're being studied, but uh, some of the early indicators are that it helps combat against cancer, inhibit uh, cancer cell growth, which is obviously something that uh, anybody would be interested in. Um, it also helps with the, your cardiovascular system and, and promotes heart health, so it lowers your blood pressure. And uh, it's a natural immunity booster. So those are three pretty important, significant things that uh, you'd want to consider when um, observing your diet period right um, so yeah those those three things um, lots of, of vitamins and minerals um, some of the reasons that uh, may interest other people including ourselves is it should be considered a cash crop so on the open market um, you could sell these in Canadian values between 20 and 25 dollars a pound which is very high when you compare them to other kind of specialty species like say oyster mushrooms, different species of oyster, you're gonna get a maximum of 10 to $12 a pound, so that's double. And then wholesale for shiitakes, you're looking at 15, $16, give or take a pound. And wholesale for, again, oysters is around six or $7 a pound, so again, double, more than double. So definitely a good investment for farmers who are looking to um, kind of diversify the, the crops that they're producing. Um, another good reason for us to grow them, and I think anybody to grow them for, for that case, is um, you get to use some of your land that otherwise would remain really unproductive. So this region is shady, as you can see, I'm filming in the shade, <clears throat> excuse me, it's about 2.30 in the afternoon, and um, this area is constantly shady, it's wet, which are the environments that, that you're going to want to provide for your bolts or your inoculated logs to uh, flush out or to produce the flowers, the mushrooms that you're going to want to consume. So I'm going to go through, uh, since, since we've gone through the, the reasons why, uh, we're going to go through now the tools that you're going to need, uh, the materials and supplies that you're going to need, and hopefully this video can provide a quick, comprehensive guide to what you're going to need to get started. Okay, so here we are. This is my little setup. Um, if I if I was going to do this again um, next year, which I'll probably <clears throat> wind up inoculating more logs next year, 
I would set up differently, um, maybe some horses with uh, six by, uh, two by six with some V's cut into them so that the logs are more easier, uh, more easy to handle and rotate and, and for the different steps of the process, which uh, can be difficult on a flat surface. But uh, basically you're gonna want to buy um, some of the mycelium. So this is a cold strain shiitake, which I think makes the most sense for us. Uh, it's least labor intensive. Um, it flowers kind of twice a year during the spring and fall, <clears throat> excuse me, flushes during the spring and fall when um, it's cold and there's a lot of rain. So that's going to save me from having to transport all these logs over here. I've done about 150 so far. Um, it's going to save me from having to transport all those logs to a water source, which we have and we can make use of if we have to, but I'd rather not have to throw these in water for 24 hours and then pull them out. Um, you're going to, I really highly recommend buying this tool right here. It's just an inoculation device. So basically it's a spring loaded um, thing. You, you tap it in, I'll show you a little more of that later when I inoculate a log, but you push the top and that put, presses the inoculant out into the bolts or the logs that you've drilled into. So you're going to need a drill. You're going to need a bit that is slightly larger than the size of the piece, uh, the steel shank that's going to go into the log itself. You're going to need some wax, which I just have this stuff here. It's natural soy, so at least it's organic. Uh, you know, there's some some stuff to be said about soy, but it's not paraffin wax. So you need some type of wax to close the wounds that you're placing in the log and uh, basically try to combat competitive fungi from colonizing your log. Then uh, a chainsaw, if you don't have access to logs, you can purchase logs, but they need to be freshly cut. So I guess uh, I'll touch on the, the species. You wanna use hardwood. So the best logs are gonna be oak and maple. Those are the top two. I've used exclusively oak so far. Next year, I'm probably gonna use some maple. Um, yeah, you can also use ironwood. I think it's called hop horn beam in the United States and, uh, muscle wood is, is called, uh, what's that hop, uh, horn beam in the United States. And then you can also use beech. Um, I don't have a lot of beech. I have a lot of oak. I have a lot of maple. Uh, you can see that these are smaller logs. So I'm selectively harvesting in groves that have older growth, secondary growth in them. And I'm taking out this kind of third stage growth that's coming in. You're gonna wanna use logs that are between four and six inches. Uh, you'd think that maybe using larger logs <clears throat> would be um, more productive, but apparently that's not the case. Uh, you want a good ratio. These aren't the best, but uh, they're still gonna do the job. So you can see the white outer layer is the sapwood and the darker layer on the inside is hardwood. It doesn't matter, uh, sorry, I'm jumping all over the place a little bit. It doesn't matter if you use white oak or if you use red oak, they both work um, basically the same according to studies. But yeah, four to six inches is easy to handle. So you're gonna need your wood, you're gonna need a drill, you're gonna need obviously the material that you're inoculating the logs with. The tool is a huge time saver. Another thing I would recommend, I'm back in the forest and um, a power source would be really useful. To have a corded drill would make this process significantly faster. There's all types of bits and different things that you can use for uh, quick cut tools that would make drilling the holes really fast. Um, this amount of work back here is taking me five or six days where you're talking six to eight hours. Uh, I probably could have had this done in about two to three days if I had have had a power source and corded tools. But uh, since we're not going, you know, really crazy, um, this, this suffices for us. So uh, another useful thing, a hatchet, all these little branches and things uh, to get those off without leaving open wounds on the tree and a flat surface that you can wax. Um, a lot of people use crock pots. I have a little camp stove back here with some propane, again, because I don't have a power source, but uh, that's something that you might want to consider. Um, 
either way people do it either way but this for us for me is easiest so yeah I guess now I'll just go ahead and I'll show you the process of inoculating the log okay so kind of the last step of the process I have a battery here so some guidelines uh, to start out you're gonna want to start about an inch away from the end of your log so that the mycelium has a chance to colonize kind of the butt ends um, and then you're gonna want to go about six inches apart every hole I'm eyeballing um, but <clears throat> it's close enough and then you're gonna want the rows to be about three inches to four inches apart and you're gonna want to put them in a diamond pattern which maybe I'll show you at the end of this to make it easy but I'll show you how quick this little process is here this is the last row I need on this log you're going about an inch an inch and a quarter deep into these things you're going to take your inoculation tool about four or five good shots into the the um, substrate and then uh, another thing I should have mentioned is that uh, uh, cleanliness is is very essential with this so a lot of people wear gloves uh, you should clean your tool with alcohol before you get started to ensure that you're not introducing any other type of fungi or any bacteria that's going to consume the sugar in the log so I'm pressing this down and I'm pushing this in uh, you want you want the uh, inoculant to be about an eighth of an inch from the top of the hole. That way, when you form, when you when you put the wax on top and close it off, it actually can seal all the way deeply into the hole, and uh, and it's not sticking out. Where if there's any type of abrasion, it'll come off and it'll be unsealed. Excuse me, and then you're inviting. Uh, pests I guess into the into the bolt which you've spent a lot of time and a little bit of money to acquire right so I'm pushing this down in as hard as I can it's important that it's tightly packed you don't you want the substrate to have contact with as much surface area of the sapwood as possible and I drill down drilling down an inch and a quarter deep give or take also uh, gives it access to the heartwood so the studies are inconclusive on how long it takes for the mycelium to connect into the hardwood itself. But uh, I think it's important that it's, it's at least touching those. So again, I'm not touching any of this with my hands. Uh, I'm not introducing anything into the log, like very, very important stuff. And I'm just going around now <coughs> compressing all these things and ensuring that they're deep into the log again so that none of it is sticking out and it won't expand out after the wax has been applied so wax I have here on my little camp stove be careful it's hot it should be very hot so you want it so that when it initially touches uh, the spot that you're sealing you're gonna to want to hear it sizzle a little bit so that does a couple of things number one if it's if it's cold when it goes on it's not gonna have any flex so when you're applying it you want it to have flex and you want it to sizzle a little bit you can hear that so so it's hot right uh, when you see little white bubbles it's almost boiling um, that's killing anything on the surface that is coming to is, has been introduced again you're you're very cautious you don't want to introduce any foreign uh, fungi or bacteria into the logs you basically just want these to have the best chance that they have to fully colonize this log without any competition it's almost impossible to have 
no competition, but you're going to do your best to limit the competition as much as possible so that you have the best chance for success. Okay, and then these two logs ends I've already sealed. Some people don't bother sealing, but I think it's important. I mean, we could go a long time without any rain and moisture coming on these logs. And I want to reduce my workload as much as possible. So I don't want to have to come back here and get these things saturated all the time. But if it doesn't rain for a week or so, you're going to want to consider coming back, taking a peek at them and making sure that they're not losing too much moisture. Um, 16 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Fahrenheit roughly will um, cause oak to lose about 4% moisture over <clears throat> a few weeks, like two to three weeks. So you're talking 2% a week type of thing if it's 16 degrees or higher. And uh, <clears throat> that's again why you're gonna wanna keep them in the shade. But basically, yeah, the moisture, uh, if the content of moisture content drops below 23% in the logs, then the mycelium's gonna die and it's not coming back. Uh, you want them to be around 35% or higher, that's gonna cause fruiting and that's gonna cause the mycelium to have a healthy, optimum environment to grow in. So I know I'm throwing a ton of information at you, but this is all important stuff if you're gonna be successful at this. And it's a long process to get set up, so I want you to be successful if you're gonna try to attempt this. Okay, I'm just gonna come over now. I'll give you a quick view of what I did and we'll wrap this up. So, here you go, you can see, I've already, oh, that one's gotta be touched up. You see how that's not quite sealed? So that, it needs to be sealed entirely. But the rest of them, about an eighth of an inch deep, again, if it goes white right away, then your wax isn't hot enough. But uh, I've tried to keep these all down deeper so that the wax is, is coating everything, including the top of the sap layer, <clears throat> excuse me. And then also the ends of the logs here, you can see the one on the right there, I need to touch up as well, but for shortness of video, it's getting pretty long you can see that I've coated both ends. Um, so those are the tools you need. Those are the reasons why you wanna consider growing this on your property, growing this food source on your property. And uh, yeah, I mean, here you go. These are the ones I've done so far. So heavy logs, lots of work to get started, but um, really worth it in the end with the payoff. Uh, this spot here, you can see back there there's some springs and there's a ton of cedar here so there's a little bit of dappled light but uh, basically you want to keep them in at least 75 percent shade so not under deciduous trees you want to keep them under conifers um, and that's that's really it that's all i could uh, that's all i can really tell you um, this spot here again is is my best shot to uh, layering these these bolts here and having them fruit uh, you can expect them to be I mean if conditions are absolutely perfect you might get a flush in this in the fall if you start in the spring but um, you know it's it's most likely that you're gonna get your first uh, production out of them in about a year the following spring and then more heavy production in the fall the year after so I'm not gonna get into the warm strain that's for the cold strain stuff and um, yeah, I mean, that's that's really about it. I guess uh, one final thing I can touch on is depending on the type of wood you're using, so I'm using oak, the recommendations are to cut it down late winter, early spring because that's when it has the highest sugar content. I would recommend after cutting some of them down in late winter and uh, sap wasn't really moving yet, it's great for sugar content, but there was really low moisture in the logs. And uh, that has me worried about the first couple pallets here that I've done. The last few pallets, uh, the sap is flowing in the maples. I'm collecting sap from maple syrup and the logs have been significantly more damp when I've cut down the rest of these, uh, these oaks. So I would recommend cutting them down later in spring in Canada, depending how things are going in the States and your weather patterns, you can make those calls, those adjustments yourselves. And then um, for maple, which is a, a 
equally good as, as oak. Um, you're gonna want to wait until sap flow is at its maximum and that's gonna increase the moisture in the logs and the sugar content in the logs. So yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. I know this is running a bit long now, but uh, if you watch the whole video and you found it useful, if you give me a like, I would really appreciate that. You could share it if you, if you um, think that other people could benefit from it, uh, the information contained in the video. And uh, as always, uh, thanks a lot for the, the subscribers, any new subscribers, thanks so much for joining in on our, our uh, journey and following along on the channel. I hope everybody has a great day. And I hope this wasn't too rushed and I hope it wasn't uh, too long for everybody, but thanks again for tuning in. Uh, have yourselves a great day and uh, happy spring 2021. Let's, uh, let's make this a better year than last year and uh, get lots done. Take care everybody, bye for now. Hello everyone.